Day TV is the Colonel speaking to you live from the Grange for British Imperial YouTube Broadcasting. And today the last of our, sadly the last of our series of Columbia Records, DB165, Mr. Potter's Sporting Broadcast. Parts 1 and 2, humorous monologue by Gilly Potter. And jolly good they've been too. Let's hope this one doesn't let us down. Good evening, listeners all. This is Gilly Potter speaking. I am out of town and shall continue to be until my creditors agree to accept three halfpence in the pound or die, preferably the latter. I am speaking tonight from the gas works at Godalming. There is, by the way, at present a deep depression over Godalming, which will continue north along the road to Guildford, where it will turn left, enter the Red Lion and disappear. Well, here we are again, all assembled, eager, excited, and I trust sober, to enjoy our periodical ten minutes of edifying uplift tempered with innocuous hilarity. But before I commence my talk, it falls to my happy lot to be privileged to announce the results of two outstanding sporting events. First of all, the boat race. Incidentally, I was asked to make a running commentary on the boat race, but I wasn't going to run from Putney to Mortlake with a microphone in my hand for the BBC or any other letters in the alphabet. But I visited the river bank with an aged friend, a very aged friend, well, you can tell how old he is. He can actually remember the year when Oxford won the race. The result was Cambridge first, Oxford second. The umpires launched two dogs and a straw hat tied for third place. The next event was the football final. I went to Wembley to witness this great match. I have now been to Wembley six times, once through the gate and five times over the wall. On the last five occasions, I have been taken there by a friend from Scotland. He comes down each year by train. A platform ticket enables him to board the train at Edinburgh, and at King's Cross he pays his fare from Finsbury Park. He tells me that this year his train was the slowest by which he has ever travelled. After stopping for half an hour for the sixth time, he called the guard and protested. The guard told him if he didn't like it to get out and walk to London. I can't do that, he replied, as my friends aren't expecting me until this train arrives. But to return to Wembley, I liked the place. I liked the crowds of people. I did very well there this year, by the way. Two watches and three handbags. Better than my friend who got one watch and three months. Talking of my watches, uh, my friend told me of an experience of his at a strange hotel which illustrates how careful one should be in such places. It's a habit of mine, he told me, to put my watch under my pillow at night. I went to bed last night, put my watch under the pillow as usual, woke up in the middle of the night, wanted to know the time, put my hand under the pillow to find the watch, and had it gone, I asked anxiously. No, he replied, but it was going. Incidentally, its loss would have been a very great blow to my friend, for it is one of the most curious watches I have ever seen. The small hand shows high water at London Bridge, and the big hand marks closing time at Gala Shields. Right, on to the next side. To return again to Wembley, I first visited the place during the Great Exhibition. My brother, not the eldest one, the scholar, but the younger one, the staunch inebriate, had an official appointment there, or rather a series of official appointments. In the morning, he was either in the waxworks as Crippin, or on the lake as Grace Darling, according to the state of the weather. If it was at all wet, Grace Darling didn't put out. In the afternoon, he went across to Canada with six others and mowed the prairie, and in the evening, dressed as a Zulu, he sold Wembley Rock and picture postcards of Lloyd George. I shall never forget my first visit on the opening day. I really went, hoping to see the Prince of Wales. I'd never seen the Prince of Wales. I'd seen the Archbishop of Brixton. In fact, I know him well. I've often had one with him. I lent him a ferret, last epiphany. He promised to let me have it back with some rabbits, but here we are, the last Friday before six of Jessima, and I've had neither. But as I was saying, I'd never seen the Prince. So I went down to where the royal procession was expected, thousands of people, all kept back by soldiers holding cannons in front of them, and by and by along came the royal procession, and I didn't know the prince. So I leant across to one of the soldiers and said to him, excuse me, where is the Prince of Wales? He said, I don't know, sir. I'm a teetotaler. However, we found another one, and I was there for some time, and then friends very kindly carried me into the stadium. Well, when I could stand up without touching Nova Scotia, I looked round and was fortunate in being able to see the Duke of York. Fortunate in the sense that half an hour earlier I could see nothing. And as I looked at the Duke, I thought of the last time that we met. 
He came back from Eton on the Monday, and I came back from Dr. Bernardo's on the Tuesday. A most interesting coincidence. Australian papers, please copy. To return to the match, it was, I believe, a magnificent match. I nearly saw it once when the man in front of me fainted. The result was Bank of England 2, Huddersfield 0. This week, curiously enough, is again full of sporting interest for me. For tomorrow, the Tufnell Park Early Closing Association are due to meet the Wandsworth and District Band of Hope Union in the final of the All England Tug of War. On Wednesday, I am playing Snakes and Ladders with the Vicar. And on Sunday, my Aunt Polly is coming from Saffron Walden. Altogether, an exciting week. Now, I was to address you tonight on the topic of station masters and their habits. And to make myself master of my subject, I wrote to 4,000 station masters in England and one in Essex. I also interviewed personally the station master at Victoria. But the 4,001 to whom I wrote, having failed to reply to my letters, and the one whom I interviewed having told me that there were no cheap tickets to Kempton Park, I think the less said about station masters and their habits, the better. Well, hopefully you enjoyed that one, viewers. Thank you, and goodbye. <laughs>